This is the United States Air Force Convair B-36 bomber, mainstay of the Strategic Air Command in the early 1950s. Sometimes referred to as the Peacemaker, it was the largest bomber ever built. The 36 also had another name, the Big Stick. With its unusual, almost hushed sound of six huge pusher propellers, this Cold War giant best reflected Teddy Roosevelt's advice on foreign policy, speak softly and carry a big stick. However, this giant's tremendous size proved to be its downfall. It's good that they never had to fly military missions because they would have been sitting ducks. The B-36 reflected a radar cross-section pattern of 44 square meters, which is tremendous. The crews always knew they were going to be in trouble when they tried to invade any Russian target. In an attempt to shore up its defenses, the B-36 also carried the greatest turret defense system ever devised. Although it never appeared obvious from the outside, the B-36 was festooned with a host of retractable gun turrets. Each turret was equipped with two 20mm cannons capable of firing in almost every possible direction. However, with the exception of tail defense, the Big Stick was the last chapter in the saga of the turret-equipped self-defending bomber. It's a story almost as old as the airplane itself. It was a run-and-gun battle 1,200 miles long. High above Germany, they fought against the Luftwaffe's deadliest fighters. Armed with the most sophisticated turrets ever devised, the air gunners from the United States Army Air Force and the Royal Air Force not only battled for their lives, but for the success and key to Allied victory, strategic bombing. Born above the trenches of World War I, the air gunner was a new type of warrior. Armed with one or two machine guns, it was his job to battle all incoming enemy fighters. It was a daunting task. Sub-zero temperatures, turbulence, and icy slipstream winds made aiming very difficult. The results were often discouraging, but the belief in the self-defending bomber was firmly entrenched. By the 1930s, the first turret-armed bombers began to appear. World War II. The RAF has the world's only bomber force armed with the latest gun turrets. Early bomber losses were horrendous, but faith in the turret-equipped bomber remained. For the Americans, belief in the turret-armed B-17 and B-24 was unshakable. By 1943, however, that faith had been torn to shreds. In the Pacific, the B-29 represented the last best hope for the self-defending bomber. Armed with the world's most advanced remote-controlled turret system, determined Japanese fighter attacks soon found their mark. After World War II, the air gunner and the powered turret all but disappeared. New jet bombers relied on height and speed for protection, but they did retain one defensive turret, the Stinger's tail. Just eight years after the Wright brothers first took flight, the air gunner was born. June 7, 1910. Two men flying a Model B Wright Flyer fire a Lewis machine gun while airborne. For Lieutenant Thomas DeWitt Milling and Charles De F. Chandler, it was a straightforward experiment. Sitting side by side, DeWitt flew the Model B while Chandler fired a full drum of 47 bullets from his machine gun. It was a remarkable feat. Roughly 12% of the bullets found their mark. European tests soon followed. November 27, 1910. Pilot Marcus D. Manton and gunner Lieutenant Stillingworth fire a Lewis gun from their Graham Witt biplane. 25 rounds result in 11 hits. A second longer burst of 47 rounds was less successful, with just 15 hits. These two experiments represented a radical shift in military capability. For the first time, armed aircraft were capable of killing from the air. Soon, they would be one of the most destructive weapons ever devised. World War I. At the outbreak of hostilities, all the warring nations were equipped with aircraft, but very few were designed to carry a machine gun. 
One exception was the Vickers FB-5 gun bus. As the world's first operational fighter, it required an observer gunner to make a kill. The most effective way to mount a machine gun was to put the engine in the rear, with the observer gunner up front and the pilot directly behind. Moderately successful, the FB-5 and other pusher types would be rendered obsolete with the introduction of the Fokker Eindecker in July 1915. The Fokker Eindecker, the world's first true fighter. Using synchronized gun gear, it was capable of shooting between its propeller blades. The advantages were enormous. Guns mounted in front of the cockpit were well placed. Straight line aiming was now possible. Success was immediate and so was the response. British and French reconnaissance aircraft added more free-mounted machine guns for self-defense. Flying solo often meant certain death. Staggered formations were devised to give small formations of aircraft covering fields of fire. But it wasn't enough. Fighter pilots, on both sides, learned to avoid the rear gunner's field of fire. For the observer gunner, it was an extremely difficult task. Battling icy slipstream winds and paralyzing cold, rear gunners often fought a losing battle. Many observer gunners learned their craft on the job. Hitting a fast-moving aircraft from another moving machine proved extremely difficult and would remain so well into the Second World War and beyond. By 1915, the Royal Flying Corps realized a new training program was needed. New qualifications were laid down. New observer gunners were now capable of not only defending their aircraft, but were trained to use cameras, send wireless messages, and direct accurate artillery barrages. By 1917, the pusher had all but disappeared, replaced by the more efficient tractor type. One of the best two-seaters was the Bristol F-2B fighter. Nicknamed the King of the Two-Seaters, it quickly became one of the most successful fighters of the war. With a forward-firing machine gun and two in the rear, the F-2B had an extremely effective one-two punch. 126 observer gunners alone claimed ace status while flying in the F-2B. As the war progressed, new and larger bombers entered service. The de Havilland DH-4 Day Bomber, the Handley Page O-100 Heavy Bomber, and the giant Zeppelin Stocken 4-engine Heavy. All had multiple gunners, but it was never enough when faced with a determined fighter opposition. By war's end, the observer air gunner's role and equipment remained relatively unchanged. The gunner's cockpit was still open to the elements. Oxygen was still experimental. The rifle caliber machine gun was still in use and protective clothing consisted of layers of leather, fur, and canvas. Twenty years later, early Second World War air gunners faced some of the same problems, but help was on the way. The impact of the airplane on the World War I battlefield was minimal. What did emerge was the vital role of the air gunner and the influence it would have on any future bomber design. The German bombing of London during the First World War introduced a new kind of warfare, strategic bombing. Men like U.S. Brigadier General Mitchell and Britain's Chief of Air Staff, Major General Sir Hugh Trenchard, firmly believed the best defense against any attack was to bomb the aggressor's capacity to wage war, destroy his factories and cities, and peace would soon follow. Theory, however, was far from reality. In June 1930, the Handley Page Hayford was the RAF's most advanced bomber. A fabric-covered biplane, the Hayford's performance in bomb load was pitiful. A new type of bomber was needed. In 1932, the Glen L. Martin Aircraft Company introduced the revolutionary Martin B-10 monoplane bomber. When the Martin B-10 bomber was introduced in 1932, it revolutionized bomber design. It was an all-metal monoplane bomber, tractable landing gear, variable pitch propellers. It had enclosed cockpit for the pilot and the first uh, turret mounted on the nose. Now, it wasn't powered, but it was manually operated and gave the gunner full enclosure from which to operate. 
It had a high speed, about 215 miles an hour. So at the time, it was faster than the uh, leading fighters in the world. And that just reinforced the proponents of the bomber that the bomber would always get through. With its speed, the fighters couldn't catch it. With its armament, even those fighters that did get close to it would be shot down and the, the bomber would get to its target. Across the Atlantic, the RAF introduced the Bolton Paul Overstrand bomber, equipped with the world's first powered turret. Mounted on the nose, it was a major step forward and received worldwide attention. For gunners, it was a marvel. Seated in a draft-free, heated enclosure, gunners achieved a hit rate of 55% against towed targets, compared to just 15% using scarf rings in open cockpits. But it was far from perfect. Powered by compressed air, it had a slow rate of rotation and could only defend the bomber from head-on attacks. To solve the problem of turret propulsion, the British turned to a French design that combined electrics and hydraulics. The self-contained hydraulic generator, powered by an electric motor, was confined to the rotating portion of the turret. As a self-contained unit, it provided the gunner with a comfortable seat and sealed gun apertures. Remarkably, the French aircraft industry and government were not interested in the design. Britain was more than happy to acquire the license for the turret and quickly instructed their firms to produce competing designs. Bristol, Fraser Nash and Bolton Paul all responded with new powered turrets. Surprisingly, Germany's aircraft rearmament program in the 1930s did not include powered turrets. Major advances in airframe and power plant development produced bombers like the Heinkel HE 111, Junkers Ju 87, and the multi role Junkers Ju 88. The Germans believed that speed, altitude, and handheld rifle caliber machine guns would defeat any fighter attack. The Junkers Ju 86, the Luftwaffe's first monoplane bomber. Introduced in 1934, the Ju-86 incorporated a number of new self-defense innovations. The nose was fully enclosed with a manually manipulated front turret. A retractable dustbin turret provided lower defense and the dorsal position was partially enclosed. Just as the new monoplane bombers began to enter service, a new and bold aerial experiment began to unfold over the skies of Spain. In 1936, Spain erupts into a savage civil war. Both sides received the latest fighters and bombers from major powers, eager to test their aircraft and tactics. During the Spanish Civil War, the Germans and the Italians and the Soviets had a great test bed for their latest designs. The Germans introduced the Heinkel HE-111 and the Dornier DO-17 bomber while the Italians introduced the SM-79 three-engine bomber. Now, all these bombers were monoplane. Uh, the German bombers were all metal, quite fast, and armed with handheld uh, machine guns and no turrets. Early versions of the German Heinkel HE-111 proved extremely effective. Sleek and fast, the all-metal HE-111 only reinforced what many already believed. A fast, well-defended bomber would be immune from fighter interception. Bombers like the HE-111, the Dornier Do-17, and the Italian Savio Marchetti SM-79 were difficult to intercept and shoot down. The results didn't go unnoticed. Bomber advocates in Britain and the US saw the Spanish experience as proof. Well-defended bombers could attack their targets with near impunity. But there was a major flaw. Fighter interception during the Spanish Civil War was rudimentary. There was no radar, with both sides relying on ground observers to spot incoming raids. Fabric covered biplane fighters like the Fiat CR-32 and Polikarpov I-15 found it difficult to reach the high-flying monoplane bombers. Now, one of the key things you have to remember about uh, bombers is, and fighters is uh, interception. For a fighter to intercept a bomber, it had to have uh, a lot of lead time. You had to know the bomber force was coming. 
the fighter had to climb to altitude and get in a position to shoot the bomber down. Now, in order to do that, uh, the, uh, the folks on the ground had to know the speed of the bombers, the height of the bombers. So for a fighter to get off the ground, climb to altitude, and reach a bomber formation uh, was extremely difficult, especially in the Spanish Civil War. There was no radar, and the warning for bomber raids were visual. So by the time a visual sighting was made and interceptors took off, the bombers were well on their way home. The other problem was the fighters, uh, their speed, in comparison to the bombers, was sometimes slower. So in order for them to intercept, they had to get up to height and be above the bombers and dive on the bombers in order to intercept. So for the Germans and the Italians, the lessons they learned from the Spanish Civil War was that their fast the bombers armed with handheld machine guns were enough to get to the target and bomb the target. The lessons learned in Spain would have a direct effect on the use of air power at the outbreak of World War II and beyond. In the United States, turret development before 1939 was slow to non-existent. Even the famous B-17, when it first appeared, did not have powered turrets. American attitudes at the time considered turrets to be too heavy and too complicated. September 1939, the German Blitzkrieg begins. The Royal Air Force has the only strategic bomber force equipped with the most advanced turrets in the world. Bombers like the Vickers Wellington and Armstrong Whitworth Whiteley are equipped with nose and tail Fraser Nash powered turrets. The Bristol Blenheim had the Bristol Mark V center turret. With just five squadrons of Wellingtons and nine with the Whitley, it's hardly a strategic force. Many believed, however, that the bomber, armed with powered turrets, would always get through. A belief that was based on nothing but faith, political expediency, and fear. The British also developed the world's first powered turret fighters, the Bolton Paul Defiant and Blackburn Rock. Both were two-seat single-engine fighters with no guns in the wings. The Defiant and Rock were never designed to engage other enemy fighters. Their sole purpose was to shoot down unescorted enemy bombers using their powered turrets. Both aircraft never got the chance. Against enemy fighters, both the Rock and Defiant suffered heavy losses. It rather looked like a hurricane. And they were going to fit a turret on this fighter and mix it with gaggles of hurricanes, hoping that it would surprise their enemy fighters. Indeed, initially that was true, but it didn't take them long to twig this, and they also twigged that it had no forward firing armament. Uh, so it was a very short um, period of, if you like, success. Air gunner training at the beginning of the war was in many ways a rudimentary affair. Armed with a 12-gauge shotgun, a gunner manipulates his Fraser Nash FN5 turret. Clay pigeons are used to sharpen the gunner's aim and fine-tune his turret manipulation skills. But just how effective were these early turrets? In terms of the, the efficiency or the effectiveness of the turrets, the early turrets especially, they were really calibrated for aircraft that were possibly slower than the ones that they were actually intercepting. It was new to them as well. It's really new technology. Um, you've got rifle caliber machine guns uh, that are supposed to give an effective spray uh, to hit an aircraft that is now approaching at probably over 270, 300 knots, especially in the head-on, which is going to be much more than that. They were also moving towards more of an optical um, arrangement for, for targeting, so their aiming was different as well. And they're moving from training gunners in uh, Virginia's and Hawker Hearts and Hawker Demons to all of a sudden be in closed turrets. That in itself with the fogging and all the other things. The efficiency of the, the early turrets, it's, it's difficult to assess. The RAF and United States Army Air Force both believed in the dominance of the bomber. They also believed that with enough defensive armament, bombers in tight formation could fight off any fighter attack, strike a target, and return to base. 
early results were not promising. Raids on German naval targets by Blenheims and Hamptons suffered heavy losses. Poor formation keeping and inadequate defensive firepower were to blame. December 18, 1939. 24 RAF Wellingtons target German warships off Wilhelmshaven. The weather is perfect. From 70 miles away, an experimental German Freya radar station detects the inbound formation. Fighters are scrambling. The Fraser Nash turrets, armed with just two 303-inch caliber machine guns, are not enough. Cannon-armed BF-109s and ME-110s rip the Wellington formation apart, shooting down 12 over the target. Six more crash land after reaching the English coast. It's a devastating blow. Further losses during the battles for Norway and Denmark in April of 1940 force Bomber Command's hand. With few options and no long-range escort fighters, RAF Bomber Command changes tactics and turns to night bombing. Well, the decision by the RAF to turn to night bombing was obviously in response to being heavily mauled, especially during the Battle of France. Some of their light bombers were, were really decimated. So they knew that they could not defend themselves against any fighter force or even anti-aircraft. Um, there was no fighter at that point that could defend the bombers. Uh, but it was an interesting decision because with the accuracy of bombing at that time, night bombing increased the level of inaccuracies, if you will. Getting close to the target at that point was probably 30 miles from the target. Whereas when we go later into the war with radar, um, they're bombing within feet uh, with their precision bombing. But it was, a, it was an interesting decision, but I think it was really precipitated upon the fact that they had developed fighters that weren't escort fighters, they were interceptors, and they were turning to strategic bombing, which was not the same way that it was in 1918 when they had first started it. The Boeing B-17. No other aircraft represented the idea of the self-defending bomber better than the mighty B-17. July 28, 1935, Seattle, Washington. The Boeing Model 299 takes flight. Bristling with multiple machine guns, the Seattle Times dubs the new bomber the Flying Fortress. The YB-17 would follow with the B-17B and C model entering service in 1937. From this point forward, the B-17, along with the consolidated B-24, were central to the development of both strategic bombing and the powered turret. The first B-17 to see combat belonged to the RAF's No. 90 Squadron. Equipped with the B-17C, operations began in July of 1941. The British were eager to test the B-17's high-altitude performance and defensive armament. Hardly a fortress, the B-17C was far from combat ready. Armed with handheld 50 caliber machine guns in the dorsal, ventral, and waist positions, with one 303 inch caliber gun in the nose, it had no powered turrets. Equipped with turbo supercharged engines, the B 17 was capable of flying higher than any other British bomber. Missions at 30,000 feet were common, but the results were disappointing. Bombing was inaccurate, guns froze at altitude. Luftwaffe fighters, undeterred by the B-17's defensive armament, pressed home their attacks with increasing accuracy. By the end of 1941, only four of the original 20 B-17Cs remained. In response, a massive redesign was ordered. The result was the B-17E, the first American bomber to see action with powered turrets. Equipped with both a Sperry top and ball turret, the B-17E carried eight 50 caliber machine guns, including two in the Stinker's tail. Hydraulically powered by a self-contained electro-hydraulic unit, the Sperry A-1 top turret had a traverse speed of 40 degrees per second and 360 degree rotation. Armed with two M2 50 caliber machine guns and a K-3 computer gun sight, the Sperry turret posed a real threat to any attacking fighter. The Briggs Sperry ball turret was an ingenious design. As the most compact turret in service, it was capable of holding a gunner, two M2 50 caliber machine guns, and a gun sight. 
Turret speed was 30 degrees per second, with a full 360 degree rotation. The Sperry Ball turret was the only really effective belly turret of the war. August 12, 1942. 12 B-17Es of the 97th Bomb Group set off on the 8th Air Force's first bombing mission of the war. Escorted by nine squadrons of RAF Spitfires, they successfully bombed the railroad marshalling yards at rouen sotteville France. So in 1942, uh, the U.S. has entered the war and they begin sending bombers over to England to begin the buildup of the U.S. 8th Air Force. Early bombing operations with the B-17E and the B-17F proved successful, but they're bombing targets in France and, and Belgium and the penetration isn't that deep. Plus, they have an escort of P-47s and RAF Spitfires. When they try to go deeper into the occupied countries in Germany, that's when they meet more resistance from the Luftwaffe, and that's where the fighter escort drops off. Even though they're flying in tight combat box formations with uh, overlapping fields of fire, the losses begin to mount. Now, the B-17F was armed with, you know, 11 50 caliber machine guns, it had two powered turrets, a Sperry on the top and a ball turret on the bottom. It also had a tail mount with uh, twin 50 calibers, a waist gunners, and two cheek mounted 50 calibers. So it was quite heavily armed. Later, as they began to make uh, deeper penetrations into uh, Germany, they found that even with these tight combat boxes, the Luftwaffe was finding a way to get into the bomber stream and shoot the bombers down. Uh, one of the things the Luftwaffe learned to do was attack head-on to the B-17 because that's where the B-17 was weakest in its defensive armament. So what happened was you had a fighter and a bomber closing in at 600 miles per hour and the German pilot, his job was to get as many 20 millimeter or 30 millimeter cannon shells into the cockpit area or an engine on the B-17. And uh, once he did this, the chances of the B-17 survival were quite slim. June 13, 1943. 227 B-17s bomb the U-boat yards at Bremen and Kiel. Losses are heavy, with 26 B-17s shot down. Air gunners claim 41 enemy fighters, but the Luftwaffe records show only seven as shot down. The results were sobering. Even with the most advanced powered turrets of the time, B-17s flying in tight defensive formations were still vulnerable to determined fighter attacks. As losses mounted, USAAF commanders searched for an answer. You wanted to know about B-17 pilot training. Well, largely it's a matter of putting across what we know about the airplane. What it'll do and what it shouldn't be asked to do. Maybe airplanes are like people. You don't really get to know them until after you've lived with them a while. It takes time, too, to get well acquainted with an airplane. Time to find out just how far you can go with her and still stay friends. That's important. And men like our instructor have lived with this airplane long enough to become pretty good friends with her. So his job is just a matter of giving you the benefit of his experience. The procedure is pretty well standardized, and you'll learn to be thankful for that. Routine, like this circle tour of the airplane at the start, for instance, makes the student's life a lot simpler. In the cockpit, you'll learn to follow the checklist because it helps you to keep your mind on your work. Detail's important when you're flying a big bomber, and using the checklist means you don't overlook a thing. Now, 
After you get the plane off the ramp and down near the runway, you're ready for the run-up. One of the most important checks of all. Center at an angle. That gets all your props safe over concrete for the run-up. And if there's a guy behind you, you won't blast him when you rev him up. As your co-pilot, the instructor locks the tailwheel while she's rolling, so that when the wheel's in line, the lock pin will drop into place. Tailwheel locked. And... Brakes! Brakes set. Maybe here you'll switch to interphone. Easier to talk that way. Then the checklist again. And the instructor's command to check trim tabs. Set them at zero. Elevator trim tab. Rudder. Aileron. Then... Before the run-up, always check your oil temperature. You ought to have at least 40 degrees before beginning the run-up. Why not close cow flaps and hurry up a little? It might mean trouble. If you close them, you get uneven cooling, local hot spots, metal fatigue. I get it. Just like bending a wire back and forth until it breaks. That's it. Exercise turbos? Right. You advance throttles to 1,500 RPM for turbo exercise. And you know why it's important to get warm oil circulating through the turbo regulators. If regulator oil is stiff or congealed, the turbo waste gates won't react properly. One avoidable cause of a runaway turbo on takeoff. Leaving turbos on, you do a repeat on the props. Give them plenty of time to change pitch. Watch the tax for that. If it's below freezing, exercise both turbos and props four times. Set the lock to keep the levers from creeping. And then, turbo's off. And before the mag check, another important detail. Before you rev them up, turn on your generators and check each one for ampere output. If they balance, they're all putting out all right. Ampere output okay. Now voltage and then turn them off. Twenty-eight and a half on each. Generators checked and off. Check mags at 28 inches, starting with number one. While you're boosting manifold pressure, you remember there's a backfire hazard during the mag check. So you check turbos off, waste gates open, just to be sure. Off, left. Don't watch the tank, watch the engine. Roughness doesn't always give you a quick drop in RPM. Off, right. Off. Throttle up to the stop, a quick check of manifold pressure, and then full turbo. Since you're using 91 grade fuel here, you can't draw 46 inches. Power's cut about 10%. You set your lock, check RPM, a little below 2500 on this fuel, take a look at the engine, and everything okay. Back slowly on the throttle because of the induction backfire hazard. Same procedure on all engines. Act to command to call the tower for takeoff clearance, and you're off to the races. Lock tailwheel. brakes. Hold it with your feet on the runway. Less hazard if you have to get away fast. Gyro. Set the gyro compass and check your compass heading against the heading of the runway. Gyro set. Generators. Generators on. There we're locked. Light out. Now let's see your rider. Three point takeoff. Three point? Three point. Pull the tail down, but don't give it enough pressure to cause a lot of wheel drag. And remember, you fly the airplane. I'll watch the engine. The cow pops open? Right. 
Hold the brakes until you get 25 inches, then let her go. You'll have rudder control by the time you're hitting 50 miles an hour. With a crosswind, you might have to use the throttles a little. Rudder's enough today. On 100 octane, you'd be using 46 inches and 2,500 RPM. A little less than that with this fuel. You'll leave the ground at around 100 miles an hour. Then a kick on the brakes to stop the wheel spin and gear up. Get rid of that drag fast. In takeoff emergencies, the bare belly is better than wheels. Check the light. Visual inspection later. 130 safe airspeed for power reduction. Manifold pressure first. Pilot's job, but today your instructor does it. Then RPM. You'll find it all in the tech orders and your checklist. Co-pilot trails call flaps, returning each valve to the locked position. Check your landing gear. Up left. Up right. And when your flight engineer gets an OK on the tail wheel, the switch is returned to neutral. Things happen fast on the takeoff. And it's easy enough to tense up a little. You did well enough, but... Don't fight her, she won't throw you. On our next takeoff, you'll reduce power. I'll just make the final adjustments. Hold your airspeed to 135 on the climb. What's our power setting? 35 inches, 2300. Let's switch back to interphone again. Do you always use this power setting for climbing? Yes, with 91 grade fuel and up to 30,000 feet. If you're climbing on instruments, you should hold your airspeed at 160. Are you keeping it trimmed? Turbo and throttle settings always depend on altitude. For instance, if we'd taken off from a sea level field, we wouldn't need turbo or even full throttle for the early part of the climb. Another thing, always cut down manifold pressure before RPM. What's your altitude? We're nearly a thousand feet above the field. Fuel boost pumps off? At uh, 1,000 minimum. Check fuel pressure before and after. Gives you another check on engine fuel pump operation. Look at your manifold pressure. Manifold pressure will creep up steadily on the climb if you don't watch it. As free air pressure decreases on the climb, the pressure differential across the turbo buckets increases. Gives you higher turbo speed and more pressure from the blower. What about carburetor air filters? Turn them off at 8,000. Don't often hit dust above that. In emergencies, though, you can use them up to 15,000. Dust that high? No, not dust. Carburetor icing conditions. So now they're ice filters? Uh, in a way, yes. Filters off. Filters take air from inside the wing. In the kind of weather that ices up carburetors, air inside the wing is drier and warmer than that you'd get from the ram air intake. Fill the lights green, filters off. Uh, check your manifold pressure. Turning the filters off increases the manifold pressure about an inch and a half. With carburetor icing conditions, of course, you'd use intercoolers hot. But you won't normally get carburetor icing above 12,000. And up there, you'll always want intercoolers cold. Thin air means higher rate of compression from the supercharger, and compression makes heat. In the wrong places. Nearly always in the wrong places. You level off at 10,000 feet and cut her down to the proper setting for maximum long-range performance on 91-grade fuel. Manifold pressure down first to 28 inches. RPM next. You make this adjustment with one eye on the airspeed indicator because you use whatever RPM needed to get 150 miles per hour indicated. In this case, with your conditions, 1,600 RPM. Then fuel mixtures to auto lean. 
and your co-pilot closes cowl flaps since you have a safe margin in head temperatures. What about the other power settings? Well, you've used three, modified for 91 grade fuel. Takeoff power, five minutes maximum continuous operation, climbing power, and maximum long range. They're all there on the panel. The power setting used in normal cruising is always figured from your flight conditions. Desired range, fuel available, weather conditions, altitude, gross weight, and perhaps one or two other things. In special cases, you'll always figure your best power setting from your flight computer. All settings are arrived at scientifically. Don't improvise. Plan the way they're written. And always keep an eye on your mixtures. In auto lean, don't use more than 29 inches with 91 grade and 2,000 RPM. Explain something? Try to. That three-point takeoff. What about it? Didn't it feel right? Well, maybe I didn't pull it right. I thought it was a little mushy. Isn't it better with the tail up? Well... And what about the stall hazard? Maybe we'd better figure it out on paper. Well, here we are. An old friend you'll remember from flying school days. She knows her way around. Call her tail up Myrtle. Now, take it easy, Myrtle. When Myrtle's parked on the ground, she's sure enough in a stalling or near stalling attitude. So on the takeoff, you lift the tail both to decrease drag and get a safe margin below the stall angle. And she takes off like a nice baby and there's no arguing about it. But with the missus here, it's different. In the three-point position, she's already in a flying attitude. On the takeoff run, the relative wind's parallel to the ground. So say the ground makes one leg of your angle of attack. Cord line makes the other leg. Angle of attack in three-point attitude, about 10 degrees. But with power on, the stalling angle for this airplane's about 19 degrees. So when you hold the tail down on the takeoff, you have a nice cozy margin of nine degrees below the stall angle. And when you leave the ground, the path of the relative wind changes so that the angle of attack actually decreases. You get maybe another four degrees of safety and you haven't a care in the world. Now let's dig a little deeper. Think of the forces at work when you take off as a team of little guys who are in there working for or against you all the time. For instance, gross weight of the airplane. On the ground, he bears down hard on the landing gear. When we're ready to start the takeoff run, you'll meet a pal of his. Wheel drag. The harder gross weight bears down on the wheels, the bigger and stronger wheel drag gets. That's definitely not good. Especially if your runway is soft or slushy. Think of lift as a kind of muscle man working from the wings, pulling up gross weight. Speed makes him pull harder. An increase in the angle of attack also makes him pull harder. Get the relationship between lift, weight on wheels, and wheel drag. The more lift, the less weight on wheels. Less weight on wheels, smaller wheel drag. Then, of course, there's thrust. He's your power. And aerodynamic drag. He's with you all the time, except when you're parked on the ground. Now, let's try to visualize what happens on a two-point takeoff. At the start of the run, lift increases steadily. Lift takes more and more weight off the wheels. Taking weight off the wheels steadily reduces wheel drag. Then, just when things are looking good, you lift the tail. Angle of attack decreases. That cuts down lift. Lift lets weight go back down on the wheels, and wheel drag increases again. Aerodynamic drag is cut a little but not enough to compensate for the extra wheel drag. Speed still won't build up as fast as it would with the tail down. Even on a smooth runway, you'll need more room and maybe 20 or 30 miles an hour more speed to get off than if you'd kept your tail down. If the runway's messed up with mud or slush or water, maybe you won't get off at all in the space you have. But keep the tail down. Take advantage of the three-point angle of attack and lift goes to work on gross weight right away. 
Wheel drag gets smaller and smaller. You'll be airborne at maybe 100 miles an hour and without using up all your runway. And that's something to remember when you're lined up in a nice homemade strip in the jungle with mud underneath you and trees dead ahead. How do you like her? Try a little problem when you get over the field. Say you're coming in after a long mission, you're a little short on gas, and when you arrive, the field's closed in. Beeline for an alternate base. No, Sal, you're the hell and gone from nowhere. You're lucky to have one base to come home to. Well, cut the end boards and hang around until she opens up. Well, you're to hover all right, but don't cut the inboards. She'll burn more coal on two than she will on four on long-range settings. Pick it over. All right, here we are. Granite stuff straight as below, up to, say, 2,000. Don't know when we'll be able to find a hole in it. Instrument letdown's out. What are you going to do? Don't you like it up here? Like it better down a bit if I'm low on fuel. Need less power and less fuel for a given indicated airspeed. Air is not so thin. Props take fewer horses. Okay, that's part of it. When you get down to 8,000, you give the command for carburetor filters on, and you finally level off at around 500 feet above your theoretical overcast. When you level off above the overcast, the idea is to keep from going places. Now, that's simple. Cut your speed down to 120, even if you have to reduce your RPM to 1250 to get it. Try it first with 1400 RPM. All right, reduce manifold pressure. Try it with 26 inches. Jettison the bombardier? No, your weight's all right. You've used up most of your gas on the way home, and I hope you didn't bring any bombs back. Cut your RPM down a little more. 1250's the minimum. With this hovering maneuver, fuel consumption's cut down to about 95 gallons an hour. At the end of a mission, you'll have a light load, so it's absolutely safe. Keep your banks at a 10 degree angle and just sit it out. Regular helicopter. Time to go in then. Landing instructions from the tower, weather, altimeter setting, and back to work again. When you're ready for a landing, be sure your co-pilot runs through the checklist. No matter how good you are, flying means fatigue, and fatigue does things to your memory. So if you want to bring in this property without an insurance claim, have everything checked in order. Altimeter, okay. Crew positions. Automatic pilot, off. Crew members at their proper stations. Side guns stowed. Ball turret guns up and pointing rear. Booster pumps on. Your power plant should be ready for full takeoff power in case a go-round is necessary. Mixtures auto-rich, intercoolers cold, carburetor filters on, wing de-icers off. That's important. Wing de-icer operation changes the stalling characteristics of the airplane. Golden Tower, this is 641 on downwind leg, over. 641 on downwind leg, cleared to land, wheels down, over. Roger. 
Landing gear down. Down left. Down right. Tail wheel down, trailing antenna in. Check brakes and hydraulic pressure. Brakes okay. Pressure around 750. RPM 2100. Turbos set. Now we have power immediately available for a go-around if we need it. Flaps should be lowered on the downwind leg but not until air speeds below 147. One third flaps on the downwing leg, full flaps on final approach. And if you have to go around, you don't need to milk up your flaps. They'll come up slowly enough. You hold air speed at 130 indicated on the base leg of the pattern. Then in a matter of seconds, you make your bank into the final approach. Flaps. High RPM. 120. 115. Don't close your throttles until you're sure of a landing. 112. 110. Freezer on. Hydraulic pressure's okay. Otherwise, you'd gunner and take off again. Valve flaps open and locked. Turbos off. Booster pumps off. Wing flaps up. Get them up sooner if you have a muddy runway. Tail wheel unlocked. Generators. Generators off. Cutting the inboard engines is the co-pilot's duty normally. The pilot should keep his mind on his taxiing. But it's quiet on the hangar apron today, and the instructor asks you to do it. Good thing, too, since you weren't too sharp about it. You can cut your inboards now. Uh, check turbos off first. You need engine oil pressure to open the waste gates. No, no. Rev them up to a thousand before you cut them. brakes? No, hold it until the chocks are in. If you set your brakes on hot drums, you'll bake the expander tubes. until the engines have stopped turning over. Baldwin Tower, this is 641. Mission complete. See that all other switches are off before turning off the batteries and the main line. Booster pumps off. Landing gear, wing flaps, neutral. De-icer, anti-icer, off. Inverters, 
Inverters off only when the instruments have returned to neutral. Inverters off. Batteries off. Main line off. Block control surfaces. That's that, except for the book work. Just give them the facts. One more thing. Record the time of day and number of minutes of oil dilution if you were diluting in this. Well, how do you feel? Okay, I feel great. Remember, it's, it's just another airplane. It's a little bigger than most. But the fact that you're flying here means that You've moved into the big time. And the payoff is it's the safest crate you ever flew. That's part of it. Not all of it by a long shot, but part of it at least. It's a little more complicated than a buckboard wagon. Still, on the other hand, it's not quite as elaborate as a battleship. Make things as easy for yourself as you can by taking advantage of little devices like the flight computer and the load adjuster and the checklist. All the rest, and that's plenty, is up to you. But I guess by this time you understand that pretty well.